Since the end of the Cold War, Japan has experienced a major shift in its strategic posturing, bringing it closer to its foreign policy and geopolitical normalization. A major driving force of this change was former Prime Minister Abe Shinzo. In particular, he was able to influence three main aspects encompassing the country's strategy. First, Japan's foreign policy. Second, Japan's military tasks upgrades. And third, the legal changes on collective defense. Perhaps Abe's main diplomatic feat was the creation of the Indo-Pacific concept. In 2013, when the Obama administration was figuring out its pivot to Asia, the Abe administration was already working on creating a wide breadth policy centered around the Indo-Pacific. During one of his first visits abroad in Indonesia, Abe laid out the main tenets of this new oceanic vision, which he called the Bounty of the Open Seas, and would then be renamed the Free and Open Indo-Pacific, or FOIP. Its main principles are stronger ties with like-minded regional powers, democratic values based on diplomacy, and the protection of trade and freedom of navigation. Abe was able to carve out a clear path in the diplomatic rainforest that is the Pacific, with the dull and tiered machete that was Japan's diplomatic vision since after the Cold War. The collapse of the Soviet Union was a fundamental wake-up call for Tokyo. The lack of a clear Pacific threat previously seen in the Soviet Union made Japan less… strategic for Washington. To make things worse, Japanese fears of closer U.S.-China relations started to turn awfully real in the early 1990s. America's cajoling with Jiang's and then Hu's China's, U.S. support in making but China a WTO member. The question is not whether we approve or disapprove of China's practices. The question is, what's the smartest thing to do to improve And the ambiguous gestures by U.S. administrations, like Clinton's infamous Japan's passing, sparked in Japan the perception of a waning U.S. support vis-a-vis -vis a rapprochement between China and the U.S. Then, a major turning point happened under PRC Secretary Xi's tenure. In 2013, a year after Abe's second coming into the Kantai, the Japanese version of UK's Downing Street, China's military started to create artificial islets in the South China Sea. Despite the warnings, the Obama administration was still struggling with uncertainties over China's role and how America should have replied to this new challenge. Only in 2016, three years and a few Obama-Xi meetings later, it became clear in Washington that Xi's promise of non-militarization in the South China Sea were inane. China's peaceful rise was no more. The militarization of the South China Sea was a deus ex machina for Japan. In 2013, Abe was able to catch on to the change and ride the new zeitgeist that was slowly turning the tides against China. Here, Abe's stroke of genius. Pin and promote Japan's new foreign policy. The bounty of the open seas that later became the free and open Indo-Pacific to the ideals of democratic values, freedom of trade and territorial sovereignty, clearly in counterbalance against China's increasingly perceived aggressive behavior in the region. By 2016, when the South China Sea issue blew up, Japan's Indo-Pacific values-based diplomacy was a three-year-old, off-the-shelf and already proven diplomatic option for America and its regional partners. The FOIP agglomerated the strategic interest of major regional actors that were wary of China's challenge to the international status quo. From India to Australia, from the US to France, major regional players put the Indo-Pacific at the center of their foreign policy's agenda. The creation of the Quad is a case in point of this. Thanks to Abe's input, four major Asia democratic powers of Australia, India, Japan, and the United States, non-coincidentally at the fringes of the Indo-Pacific region, united under the banner of defense and democratic values, territorial sovereignty, and in curbing assertive regional power, a clear reference to China. The Indo-Pacific has not only united regional players, but also countries further away. For example, 2021 and 2022 marked the year when a British carrier group left its hunting grounds in the Atlantic and sailed all the way to Japan. Not only the UK, but also Dutch, French, Canadian, and even German vessels all called ports to Japan, 
demonstrating an unprecedented interest in the Indo-Pacific region. The new interest on the maritime security of the wider Indo-Pacific marked a watershed since post-Cold War Japan's self-defense forces tasks. During the Cold War, the Japan Self-Defense Forces JSDF, focused on keeping tabs against Soviet Union and its proximate region, especially in the northern Kuril Islands and the Sea of Japan. Thus, the Japanese military maintained substantial forces in the northern island of Hokkaido, thought to be at the center of a Soviet offense in case of a conflict with America. Only under Prime Minister Suzuki Zenko in 1981, the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Forces JMSDF, committed to the military role outside of Japan's proximate region in the protection of major logistical oceanic routes, the so-called Sea Lanes of Communication, up to a distance of 1,000 kilometers off from Japanese shores. Suzuki was then followed by Prime Minister Nakasone Yasuhiro in the late 80s, which focused on expanding JSDF tasks and capabilities which freed up U.S. regional forces from Japan's territorial defense. However, the sunset of an old foe to the east was welcomed by the rise of a new one in the west. In the turn of two decades, the Soviet Union's role of a main strategic adversary was supplanted by China. This meant a major overhauling of Japanese military internal structure and operational capabilities, and most importantly, a shift of focus from the Cold War era land warfare in the island of Hokkaido to sea, air, and amphibious operations along the first island chain in the Ryukyu archipelago. In this context, Japan started a major upgrade of its air force and navy. For its Air Force, Japan heavily invested in boosting its refueling and airlifting capabilities with two new platforms, the KC-46 and the indigenous Kawasaki C-2. The acquisition of these platforms can be seen mostly in view of redeployment and force projection over long distances to far-flung islands in the East China Sea or to the Pacific. Japan's territory and exclusive economic zones expands for nearly 4 million square kilometers roughly half the size of Europe, demanding range and speed of action. Almost 3,000 kilometers separates Japan's southern tip in Miyakojima to Wakanai in Hokkaido northwest, around the same distance between Los Angeles and New Orleans, making these platforms essential to move and redeploy troops and equipment with short notice. Consequent to the 2016 blunders of failing to detect a DPRK missile test, Japan has also brought forward the main program of reinforcing its AWACS and ISR platforms. The purchase of four E-2D fitted with AN-APY-9 radar further expands the reach of the sea-based Aegis capabilities, not only belonging to the Japanese Navy, but also those of allied nations like the US and Australia. Along with the rollout of new Aegis-equipped vessels like the Maya-class destroyers, Japan has embraced the upgrade of new maritime platforms. The new FFM Mogami class represent a new line of stealthy frigates, and the new lithium-ion battery-equipped Taigei-class submarines increase the JMSDF intelligence gathering and deterrence capabilities. The refurbishment of two Izumo-class LHDs for the deployment of F-35Bs should also be seen as a force projection capability, especially in retaking remote islands. The singling out of China as the main challenger to Japan's security has sparked a major focus on the protection of remote contested islets, like the Diaoyu Senkakus, and in amphibious and area denial warfare. A major upgrade for the JMSDF was the creation in 2016 of the Amphibious Rapid Deployment Brigade. This unit, which obtained operational readiness in 2018, is the first ad hoc component in the JMSDF specialized in amphibious warfare. In 2023, this new unit will have its own base in Uruma, Nagasaki Prefecture. In Saga, also close to Nagasaki, will be deployed the majority of the V-22B squadrons, which will be the major airlifting backbone for the newly formed Amphibious Brigade. Nagasaki's prefecture location, close to the major U.S. Navy and JMSDF joint base of Sasebo, and the proximity to the Ryukyu archipelago makes it the perfect stepping stone in the projection of force in the East China Sea. 
Here, the JSDF is also developing anti-access and area denial capabilities, A2AD, mainly via the deployment of ground defense forces, equipped with Type 12 missile batteries along the Ryukyu archipelago. In 2020, a battery was deployed for the first time in Miyakojima, and in 2023, another one will be deployed to Ishigaki-jima. These air-to-surface anti-ship missiles have a range of 200 kilometers, and its new version, which will be rolling out over the coming years, probably have a range of more like 900 kilometers, making it capable of completely shutting off access from the East China Sea into the Pacific Ocean. Perhaps the major change brought on by Abe's government was the creation of new legislation regarding the interpretation of Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution. These new constitutional interpretations can po kaishaku, move away from Japan's post-war stance of individual self-defense, kobetsu teki jeiken, towards a limited gentai teki, collective self-defense interpretation, shudan teki jeiken. Between July 2014 and September 2015, these changes became embedded into the Japanese legislative system. In particular, a cabinet decision laid out three new conditions, Shinsan Yokin. These allow the use of force when an armed attack against a foreign country that is in a close relationship with Japan occurs, when there is no other appropriate means available to repel the attack to ensure Japan's survival and protect its people. The use of force is limited to the minimum extent possible. As argued by Warwick University professor Christopher Hughes, these conditions allow for ample interpretations regarding the use of JSDF in combat operations. In particular, they paved the way open to assisting U.S. forces in combat situations, which was precluded before 2015. Before this, the Japanese government was able to limit deployment of the JSDF to non-combatant supporting roles, like War in Iraq 1991 and the deployment in minesweeping operations in the early 2000s in the Persian Gulf. The lack of clearly scoped constitutional breaks, Kenpojo no Maikaku na Hadome, hints that how these new conditions will be interpreted lies in the executive overall judgment. Shogoteki ni Handan Suru. These breaks, Hadome, have been ambiguously defined by Abe's administrations. For example, when explaining these, Abe's wording was to generally not dispatch abroad. When further pressed, the government caved in and provided to the Diet a few cases where the use of force is allowed in overseas territories. First, in support of an invaded close country, Misetsu, Kaneki Kuni, no Ryudo, Juriku Shi. Second, in support of an invaded close country, moving to take back its invaded territory. Third, in case of an invasion on the attacking country. On this regard is particularly poignant that the U.S. is Japan's main and foremost ally, making them the closest country. This new legislation builds up a new body of constitutional interpretations of the Article 9, providing legal grounds for important foreign policy objectives, like the protection of regional partners, like South Korea and Taiwan, and close support to U.S. forces against possible confrontation with China. If, on the one hand, this new interpretation allows Japan to take a step closer to its security normalization and provide a more credible deterrence strategy, on the other, it also escalates the risk of embroilment in the U.S.-led foreign conflicts. If before 2015, the Japanese government could say, sorry, we can't, now a denial is more difficult to justify with Washington. Abe's sudden death, which you can learn more about in this incredible video, bears major consequences for Japan geopolitics and strategic posturing. Abe was able to take advantage of the right timing to shift Japan's foreign policy, expanding it from its most proximate region to the fringes of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. He was also able to turn the JSDF focus from land into a proper blue water and amphibious force. And perhaps more importantly, 
he was able to take a step closer towards Japan's security normalization, thanks to the legislative changes in the interpretation of the collective self-defense of the Japanese Constitution, Article 9. This last one is unarguably his most substantial legacy to Japan's security strategy. Japan is now able to defend its allies and forward its own national interest. I think you might also be interested in checking out this part one video on Korea's strategy here. We go deep on the maritime role of the peninsula in the region. Let me know what you think in the comments and thank you so much for watching.